Mr. Speaker for the night. That's why everybody's here. And I've been told that I'm not trustworthy to draw the names out of the bin for the door. I mean, who? if you can't trust your pastor, who can you trust? So, Joan, I'm going to ask you to draw a name. I think this is rigged. Where's Luke Reedy? Luke! Come up and get your mug and your magnet, man. Come on up. Give Luke a hand. You cannot get better than a Keith mug and a Tennessee magnet. You can't get any better. All right. Rhett Belk. Rhett, come up here, buddy. There you go, Rhett. Congratulations. That's awesome. All right, we'll, we'll hold uh, the rest of the mugs till later. This one's for two tickets to the first Tennessee game. All right. I was going to say Elkin. All right, I'm going to go with Carl Mason Sumner. Carl Mason. Did they have to leave? All right, I'm going to I'm going to get in. They said they had soccer. They had the, they had soccer that night. So y'all good with another draw? One more draw. Reagan's so nervous. <laughs> James Arterburn. Art Artabom. Are you serious? We're gonna draw another one. Katie Belk. <laughs> I promise you, I promise you, this is not rigged, but they are going home. They are going home with some prizes on that back row. Everybody, I, I'm going to give you a chance to move to that back row in just a minute. Everybody's going to do that. Guys, I'm excited about tonight. Uh, this is all happening because Bill Emmendorfer came and uh, just said something about bringing Joan Cronin down, and I was like, let's do it. Uh, I've asked Bill to give a brief testimony tonight, so if you don't know Bill, you need to get to know him, but Bill, come and speak to us tonight. Brief. <laughs> Well, it's great to see this crowd here tonight. It's great to kick Wednesday nights off. And, you know, it's a little intimidating to speak to folks in your hometown about because they know you pretty good. And I thought about it. And then today in my daily devotional, it kind of got driven home what I was going to say. Most of you all know I've been blessed my whole life. I've been blessed with great parents. And, you know, my mother, buddy, when the church doors were open, you were at church. I mean, it was like you didn't have a choice. You'd be dead, but you're going to church unless you're in the hospital. And, and, and for most of us that are parents and grandparents, I think that's true. If you raise your children that way, they'll come back. But you know, I've been blessed with the ability to, my family moved to Cleveland when I was young and grew up in Cleveland at a time when it was, I described it once to the paper as living in Camelot because everything was great happening. I had a chance to play on a football team that didn't lose a game the last two years of high school, won state championship had a chance to win a wrestling state championship, had a chance to go to the University of Tennessee on a football scholarship, had a chance to play with some great teams, to, to be one of the captains, and had a chance to, to be all SEC in two different sports, and was truly blessed. But the greatest blessings in my life, I think, have been my failures. Because sometimes we, as athletes, get to believing in ourselves 
too much and we lose our sight and lose our course. And I think my failures in life fortunately have been few, but I think as the good Lord bring me back to where I needed to be and doing the things I needed to do and going back to my roots. And so I'm really thankful for the blessings of my failures. And when you have failures later in life, it really wakes you up and drives things home. And so yeah, I've been blessed with a great family and a great wife and a great community to, to live in and, and, and many great friends. So those blessings that far offset any of the other things that most people would consider successes and, and that. Now, sometimes I may not reflect that when I'm trying to keep Fred from cheating on a racquetball court, and I don't get competitive. I don't get very competitive, but I do have to admit that once you tee it up, my whole personality changes, and I really can't help that. I guess I should be able to, but I can't. So that's, that's a little bit about where I am today, but I think that this faith that I think I learned as a child, carried over to an adult, and it's, it's really a big part of, of what my life is all about. So at this time, I want to introduce somebody that's really special, and that's Joan Cronin. Joan, Joan and I have been great friends for a long time, and we've done some projects that have been very interesting, and Joan has always been in my corner, and I've always been in her corner. We served together the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. We've done a lot of projects for the University of Tennessee. And I was reflecting on something Coach Battle told me when he was athletic director at Alabama. He said, well, as long as Nick's here, as long as Nick's here, I'm great. And you could say that about Joan and Pat, but the reality is Joan built a program that's unprecedented in intercollegiate women's athletics. And when you go back to the history of athletics at the University of Tennessee, it goes back to the days of Ed Bowling and Bob Woodruff and Joan Cronin and the way they structured the athletic department and given Joan autonomy in her division. And, you know, she started off, and, and when you see it today, it's hard to imagine where they started. I mean, Pat's doing wash in the dead gum. She's washing uniforms, and, and they're driving to games in cars and buses. And from there, Joan has built a program that not only is national contender and champion in, in basketball, but in swimming and track, in, in volleyball and softball. And, and, and you know, and, 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 and we are in the competition in air soccer, and it's unprecedented what she's been able to do. And so much so when we needed athletic directors, they made Joan athletic director not of the women's program, but the whole program. And now she's athletic director emeritus, which means she's there till she dies. And <laughs> which I hopefully is not going to be anytime soon. But, uh, but no, Joan's a dear friend. You know, one thing I'll say in life, you have, if you have five friends that you can count and go to the wall for you, you're blessed. And Joan's one of those five. So I'll give you Joan Cronin. Thank you, Bill. That was really special. Uh, athletic Director Emeritus really means that you're old. <laughs> it, it means you don't have to make any more major decisions, and you get to smile a lot. But I smile a lot when Bill Emmendorfer calls, because we have had so many great projects together, and I can't tell you all how much I respect him and what he has done for Athens, what he's done for Knoxville, what he's done for the University of Tennessee, what he did for the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. So, Bill, when you call, I come, but I didn't know I was going to get to meet lots of my new friends and have a new preacher and uh, have, have a tailgate. I love tailgates. I ate two hot dogs. I, I, didn't, I didn't eat the buns, but I ate two hot dogs. That was pretty good. I love tailgates when they're orange. And I love tailgates when we play Rocky Top. So all, all, all of that was good. You know, I want to tell you how excited I am about your new coach in Melissa Smith. I listened to five of her sermons. She, and the first thing I learned was this last Sunday, she let you all out 15 minutes early. <laughs> I just thought that was awesome. I, 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 just, I just thought it was really, really good. And, uh, but I, I just am excited about her being here. I'm excited about Big Orange Country and bringing it in to Cleveland. You know, the state of Tennessee is a special place. We are so lucky that from 
Knoxville to Johnson City to Chattanooga to Nashville to Memphis. There are a lot of orange people. And the, it's just so much fun to get out and go to tailgates and, and see the people. I just love it. You know, not only did she give you, let you out 15 minutes early. You know, I get a call to speak a lot, and they'll call and say, Joan, would you do this? And I usually will say yes. And I'll say, how long do you want the program? And they'll say, 45 minutes or so. And I'll say, uh-uh. The preacher doesn't preach more than 20 minutes, or he shouldn't preach more than 20 minutes. And I don't need to do more than 20 minutes. So hang on, I'm going to tell you a lot of things in 20 minutes tonight. But her first sermon was, love is what we need. What we, it's all about loving forever. And you know, that hit me so hard because I really believe if I could be goddess to the world, I would say we only need three things. We need love, we need grace, and we need civility. And I was telling Bill just a minute ago, we need to be in a time that we shake somebody's hand, you look them in the eye, and you mean what you say. You don't have to go get all these contracts and everything else. So that one really, really hit me. And then she talked about the prodigal was rec reckless extravaganza. And I thought, man, that sounds pretty good to me. I could do that. But I didn't think I was a prodigal, but that, that's, that's pretty good. Her second sermon was in the right place at the right time. And that hit me because, as Bill said, we've been so lucky at the University of Tennessee in developing a women's athletic program. My journey started when I was 12 years old. I grew up in Opelousas, Louisiana. It took me to third grade to learn to spell that. That's pretty, pretty big words. But I grew up, and you know Barbara Mandrell's song that she was country before it was cool to be country? Well, I was a tomboy before it was cool for women to be in sports. And I went down and tried out for Little League Baseball, and this nice gentleman wouldn't let me play. He offered to let me be a manager. He offered to let me be a scorekeeper. He even got desperate and offered to let me be assistant coach. But he wouldn't let me play. And I knew at that time, I wanted to be in a business that helped women learn to compete. And I think athletics is one of the best ways to learn to compete. If we went around this room and said, what do you, ask some of you guys, I asked Scotty Mayfield, what made you successful? I learned about teamwork. I played on this team and I played on that team. You go around and ask some of us that are a little bit older, we didn't have that opportunity. So it is so much fun for me to see what's happening. And your University of Tennessee did the best job of supporting women of anybody in the country. And it was just really, really special. You know, I, I got to work with that, that lady called Pat Summit. That helped my job a little bit. She used to go around and see, she'd introduce me, say, this is Joan Cronin, this is my boss. And I would say, uh-huh, yeah, we work together, we really do. You know, whenever I didn't get anything, I just sent her up there and said, go stare at them for a little while. We'll, 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 we'll get it, we'll, we'll get it. But we were a great partnership in that our goals were the same, our values were the same, and we not only developed a basketball program, but as Bill said, we developed an overall program, and that's one of the things that I'm really, really proud of. So when um, Melissa was talking about right place, right time, I am so thankful that I was in the right place at the right time. Third sermon, you remember all these? Okay, good. God is in this house. God, is, you, play, you played that song. That's one of my favorite, favorite songs. And I got to thinking about some of the things that were important to me. I, like Bill, grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in the Methodist church, but it was in South Louisiana, and they were 99% Catholic. And there was this little bitty Methodist church and this little bitty Baptist church. And that was when Catholics didn't eat meat on Friday. You couldn't get a hamburger in my hometown on Friday. So I told them that Methodist don't eat green peas on Tuesday. <laughs> so if you find somebody that comes up to your church and visits and said, do y'all eat green peas on Tuesday? You're going to know they're from Opelousas, Louisiana. But, you know, when I think about
God is in this house, I think about how lucky we are to be able to worship. And when I think about athletics, one of the things that's meant a whole lot to me going through my athletic administration career is Fellowship of Christian Athletes. If you aren't supporting Fellowship of Christian Athletes, you need to do it. Because they have a way to get into the high schools, to get into the middle schools, and have huddles. And so far, you know, we, nobody's come in and thrown us out because we, we've done it right. And I just love FCA programs. Robert Green, who is from right up here in Cleveland, is now our state director. And he is doing an awesome job of helping with FCA. I finally got a, uh, we've had a male director for FCA on campus for a long time. Now we got a female and a male, and I am so excited about Jessica being able to be there and work, work with Chris Walker. Got to tell you a little story. You know, we all like our grandchildren. That's why we have children, because the grandchildren are pretty special too. And my number three grandson went away to college this weekend. He's going to play baseball at the College of Charleston. So, you know, I've been lecturing him for 18 years about life and life. So I got one little last lecture this weekend before he went to move into the dorm. And I said, Quinn, three things for you to remember. I said, one, don't miss a class. Two, sit on the first three rows. And three, go to all the FCA meetings, because I will know you're associating with the right people. He grinned at me and he said, Grandy, the captain of the baseball team is also president of FCA. I said, yes, my answers, I'm answered here. But, but what, if I had Pat Summit standing next to me right now, and you ask her, what is she proudest of? Now, this is somebody who's won every award that could possibly win. You know what she would tell you? That I coached for almost 40 years at the University of Tennessee, and every young lady who played for me for four years graduated. So academics was always real important to us. So yes, God is in this house, and God was in our program because we had FCA to work with the athletes, and we had coaches who cared about Christ and what that meant. Number four, make excuses. I thought that was pretty good. I, I'm good at making excuses, you know. I can't go that early. I've got to do this. All those things, you know. But when Tennessee decided they needed women's athletics, they said, no excuses. We're going to do it, and we're going to do it right. And I was really, really proud. And sometimes, you know, as you go through life, I bet you some of you today had some places that you kind of stumbled, and you thought, golly, they're not doing it the way I want them to do, or that didn't quite work out, and they all come up with excuses. One thing that I'd like to share is sometimes don't forget about using humor and when you're dealing with people, because we get to, sometimes we take ourselves so serious that you forget to laugh. Story was, and Bill was working with me at that time, we were, when I came, the Thompson Bowling Arena was being built. And the women weren't going to play. And Pat didn't want to play there. Dr. Bowling said no. The chancellor said no. And I drew the line in the sand and I said, if y'all want me to be AD, we have to play in the new arena because you only get one chance to make a good first impression. Well, they were all worried about it being too big. Where, the, where were we going to get lost? Pat was worried about... She said, if I have Stokely, I don't have to worry about the men and practicing and scheduling. It'll be all mine. And I said, yeah, but we can get a lot of people in that new arena. So we did. And the first night, we sold it out. In fact, I had to go out on the street and hand out tickets for people to come back the next game because they couldn't get in. Nicest note I ever got from Pat was just, you were right. This is the right thing to do. But go fast forward, we had to look at locker rooms because they weren't planning on us. So I was going to take over a visiting locker room, make ours bigger, make it the same size as the men, and thought that made a whole lot of sense to me. We had plenty of visiting locker rooms. So one day I'm walking in the office, and somebody comes running up to me and said, Joan, this, and she named an associate AD, 
And they said, he said that over his, over his dead body, were well, you going to get that locker room? And I thought, hmm, that sounds interesting. So I could have done a lot of things. I could have gone to the president. I could have screamed. I could have said, the new, tell the newspaper they can't do that. You know what I did? I walked in my office and I picked up my phone immediately. And I called him. I said, this is Joan. When am I going to your funeral? <laughs> he laughed. I laughed. And we both smiled. I said, come on down. We can work this out. And I got the locker room. And we all had fun. And the last sermon that hit me was the seasons of your life. You know, the fact that if things are good, we're probably going to have a bump in the road. The things are bad. And, you know, to, to make those seasons of your life, you've got to get, keep Christ in your heart because we're all going to meet the good and the bad. When I say seasons of your life, I have to think right now. It's football time in Tennessee. <laughs> Isn't that season time? It's this season, and next Thursday, we're opening up. I am so proud of what's happening at the University of Tennessee in our athletic program. Everybody's marching to the same drummer. We've got great kids. We've got great administrators. Josh and his staff are wonderful people as well as wonderful coaches. You think about Rick and Kelly Jolly. I wouldn't train them for anybody in the country. They are so good as basketball coaches, and you can just go right down the line. You know, last year, we won the SEC All Sports Trophy. I called Danny White, who is our athletic director now, and gang, he is good. He is really good. I, I, I just shows you how old I am. I know his dad really, really well. His dad was AD at Notre Dame and Duke, and we were on lots of committees and did a lot of working. Danny is a true AD. He's going about it in the right way. So I called him as soon as that came out. I said, Danny, some of us worked 30 years and never won the all-sports trophy. And I kind of said, the women won it several times, but we never won it together with the men and the women. But you did it all. And you know what he told me? He said, Joan, I'm so excited. We're going to continue to win. So it is so much fun to be in an athletic program at a university that cares about women's athletics. Randy Boyd is a great president. Don D. Plowman is, I think, one of the best communicators I've ever worked with. And Danny White's a great AD. So you take all of that together, I think we're in good shape. You know, some people talk about, when you talk about the University of Tennessee, you just talk about athletics. We're a lot more than athletics. I've always said that athletics, if, if the university was a home, athletics is a front porch. It's the thing that's most visible. It's the thing that you see first. We get Lamar Alexander. And I have to work all so hard to get all of these academic programs in. But I think that's why I felt so strongly that to be an athletic director, that I wanted to keep that porch clean and strong and appealing for people to come in. When I think about Pat Summit and I think about the difference she's made, I got two stories I want to tell you, and then we'll see if anybody wants to ask any questions as we go. One is, Pat Summit was the most focused person I've ever worked with. She knew what she wanted. She knew how she wanted to do it. She was a great multitasker. I'll never forget, we had basketball camps, and one day, anytime we had a camp, the first day of camp, she would walk into Thompson Bowling Arena. There'd be a 1,000 12-year-olds out on the floor there for camp. And she would walk in and say, how many of you made your bet up today? And a few little girls would raise their hand. And so she went on to tell them, because that's what athletics does. It teaches you so much. She taught them about why you do that. It's, it's discipline. It's getting your life straight. It's keeping everything from the very beginning each day doing. So by Friday, when she went back, and that voice said the same thing, how many of you made up your bed today? 
all those little hands. Well, I told that story about a year ago to a group of women. And just about three weeks ago, I was walking down market, in the market square, and I see this lady coming towards me. Well, I know I've seen her, but I don't know who she is, but you can, I could tell she recognized me. So I was trying to prepare and be nice, and I said, how are you doing? And she said, well, I was doing well till I saw you. And I thought, oh my gosh. And I said, what's wrong? She said, well, you spoke to my group, and you told me that story, what Pat said about making up her bed. She said, I made it up for a whole year until this morning. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I didn't. So, uh, but you know, the morning Pat died, we were trying to prepare because we wanted to be about family and not, not about media and all the things that could happen. So we had a game plan, and I knew what I was supposed to do. And my job was to go immediately and be sure that the press wasn't involved. And uh, so I get this call about 5 a.m. from Tyler, and he said, Joan, Mom's gone to heaven. And I said, I'll be there in 15 minutes. Don't worry. So I jumped up, got dressed. You know, here is somebody I've worked with for 30 years, one of my best friends. And I'm trying to think, what do you... Well, you were supposed to do this, you were supposed to do that. And I went running out of my room, and I turned around, and my bed was unmade. Guess what I did? I went back and made my bed up that morning and thought so much of Pat. You know what was good about working with Pat? And I think it's good about what your coach is doing over here. Remember, I called her coach. I would extend her, extend her contract if I was her AD, <laughs> so I'm not going to say, say anything here. But uh, Pat always did what she was going to do, say she was going to do. And she didn't just preach, but she walked the walk. And she was, as I said, was so proud of the student part of student athlete. She was recruiting a young lady from up in Kentucky. And she was from the very poor section of Kentucky. I mean, the academics were bad. The economics were bad. But this young lady wanted to come to Tennessee. So she came in, was talking to me, and I said, like any good AD would do, how good is she? And she said she's really good, and she really wants to come. So I said, well, in our world, you can go in and visit in her home, and we can bring her on campus and visit with her when she comes on campus. So why don't you go visit and see what you think? So she called me on the way back after she had visited, and she said, she really wants to come. And I, I think she could make it. I said, well, let's bring her in on campus. Our kids are great recruiters and a good, pretty good judge of characters. Let's see how she does for the weekend. So this young lady came in for the weekend. And I'll never forget she, me going down to the office on a Saturday morning. And standing outside of my office was a tall, attractive, blonde young lady dressed in one of the most expensive-looking suits that I'd ever seen. Well, you can imagine my mind talk, thinking, Pat described poverty, and she looks like a model, and I love her suit. So finally I said, you know, you look so nice, I love your suit. She looked at me and smiled, and she said, Miss Cronin, when Pat came in to visit, my mother drew a picture of the suit that Pat had on, and my mother made this suit to come, again, I, she was signed. I, soft-hearted, I, we'd already made a difference in her life. She came in her first in, freshman and sophomore year. She wasn't the star, but she was kind of the blue-collar worker. She made things happen, and she did really well academically. Well, we get ready her junior year, and uh, starting the season, right in the midst of SEC time, my academic advisor comes in and said, Joan, she's struggling academically. It's not that she's not trying, it's just she's like on that treadmill and can't catch up. So I called a summit conference, I called Pat and our academic advisor and this young lady, and we talked about what we were going to do to help her academically. And what we decided as a team, her included, was that she was going to not have to practice, she was not going to go on the road to give her time to catch up, but we were going to let her start at all the home games. So it was kind of like tough love, you know, you give your kids a lollipop 
We said, okay. So she did that. And after about two weeks, the academic advisor came back, gave me a thumbs up, said she's doing great. So she started playing and practicing and traveling. We went to the SEC tournament. It was actually down here in Chattanooga. And we lost in the finals. But this young lady made the all-tournament team. I can remember how excited I was. We hadn't denied her an opportunity to be the best she could be. We go on to the Final Four that year. We're getting ready for the semifinal game, and as AD, I'm trying to be sure everybody has their tickets. The president's planes landed. The alumni are having the reception. The coaches have everything they need. And I run back to my room to change clothes for the game, and my phone rings. And it's this young lady, and she's crying. And I said, what's wrong? She said, I wanted you to be the first person to know that UT just called, and I made the dean's list. So she made the dean's list. She went on to help us win a national championship. And the next year, she became the first person in her family ever to graduate from college. So when I think of seasons in your life, that was a pretty special season for us. I thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. Anytime you want to have a tailgate, just call. I like hot dogs and I like orange, and it'll be fun. Let me take three questions. Yes, sir. Uh, let me tell you something about abuse. <laughs> I'm playing in a croquet tournament, and I think I'm pretty good. And I've won about three rounds and just running through, beating all these people, and I ran into him. And he beat me. He abused me. He just didn't beat me. He abused me. So what can I do for you? <laughs> That's right. I, I was hoping nobody would ask that question, but <laughs> what, athletics has changed more the last six months than I think ever college athletics ever. First of all, we, the conference situation, you know, Alabama, I mean, Oklahoma and Texas are coming in to the SEC. I'm off. If they're going to leave, I want them. I like their money. So we can, we, can, we, can, we can do that and it'll be good. Then came the portal. I feel like the portal should be called the cesspool. I don't like it. I think we're trying to teach young people to make decisions to do all this. And we're saying there's got to be a way that we can help those that don't belong and yet not open it up to just transferring as many times as they want, wherever they want to do. What's happening, what I worry about, is there are kids who put their name in the portal, which means we're no longer, say it was a Tennessee kid, that we're no longer obligated for them once they say they want to transfer, and they don't get a place to go. And they had like 500 women basketball players left in the portal this year that didn't have a place to go. So people are getting hurt that way. So I am not crazy about that. The NIL, we need some kind of guardrails. Right now, I think what we have is pay for play. I'm not saying that the athletes don't deserve some compensation in what we do, but we just, when you put the portal and you put the NIL money and don't put any guidelines, I love being athletic director emeritus this time. <laughs> so, but we'll figure it out and we'll make it where it's fair, but it's going to be a long, long road. And I'm sorry if some of you don't understand that inside athletic terms, but it's, it's a tough time in athletics right now. Other questions? Anybody else? Okay, golly. <laughs> He's got me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, I certainly will. When they hired me at Tennessee, I was women's athletic director. And Bob Woodruff was men's athletic director. And then Doug Dickey became men's athletic director, which meant I was in charge of the women's program and they were in charge of the men's program. We worked extremely well together. And for us just getting started, it was a godsend. We really, it helped us focus on what we wanted to do. We didn't get lost in the, the, all the other stuff. But as we grew and as the finances grew and the development grew, uh, I felt like it was time to merge together. 
for financial reasons, why, like when you buy another company, you merge them in. And, uh, but I wanted to be sure it was done right. So when I got named athletic director over the men's and women's, I said, this is the right time. If I do it, everybody can get mad at me and maybe not at the university. But it really wor has worked out well. I think the women have benefited. I think the men have benefited. And so that's why I think we're going well. So I'm, I'm fine with that. And uh, just don't let them forget the AD emeritus uh, along the way. Anything else? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Soccer, lacrosse, whatever, yeah. Yeah, abs absolutely. I think one of the things that we have done is kept the academic standards high. To be admitted to the universities and to stay and be able to play, you have to pass so many hours. And, and we have a lot of support for young people that struggle. When I said, told my grandson, sit on the first three, first three rows and don't miss a class, that was my rule for our athletes. If they didn't do that, they didn't play the next game. You only have to do that once or twice, and they, they go to class, because I think that's a great way to be, do the best that you can be. So I think the academic standards and what we do to help the athletes is really good. Whenever I get lots of calls from moms and dads and grandmoms, you know, Sally wants to go to the University of Tennessee, or Billy wants to do this, the first thing I say is be sure they're doing well in school. No matter how much they're doing well on the field, if they don't do well in school, we can't help them. So thank you. I think that was real important. Again, I appreciate being here. I love the tailgate. I love the fact that you all support Tennessee. I love the fact that in a Christian organization, we can just still sit down and talk about things that make a difference. And again, that's what I heard in your coaches' five sermons was things that are going to help us that are biblical that we can be very practical with. So I, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to drive to Cleveland every Sunday, but I might show up sometime. You never know. Thank you. Scotty's not allowed to ask any questions, but we are uh, going to present Joan. Uh, this is a welcome gift for you. This is a thank you gift for coming to uh, Keith Memorial. Are we glad that she came tonight? Thank you. Bill, I'm going to trust you to pick, pick out our, our next Don't winner. On the back row. Yeah, the back row doesn't count. Sarah Prince. Your <laughs> Keith mug. All right, we got one more mug before we get to the football tickets. Stir them up in there a little bit, Bill. No wonder everybody stayed. You're I know, right, man? Mug. Georgia Sumner. <laughs> we got another Sumner, man. And they had to leave. They had to leave, but they said they couldn't go to. Uh, to the game, so let's start. Tell them to go start. buy a lottery ticket. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll save the mug. This is for, uh, I haven't looked at the name. This is for two of the football tickets, all right? Madeline Adams. She left. Should we go ahead and give them to her? Can you give them to Madeline? She wouldn't go? Are you just saying that because you want to win? <laughs> Jamie McKinney. Jamie. See me after Jamie and I'll show you how to get a hold of those tickets. We've got one more set of tickets. Bill, you got one more name in there? You have to be present to win the tickets tonight. Alice Gilry. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I'll give this one to the Sumners who won the uh, the gift. I know, man. What is what is up? I mean, that is like the luckiest row. Y'all should really like do something to. Uh, but you know, you know, if you win the lottery, the church gets eighty percent, right? Y'all know that. Y'all know that. I know, right? For sure. Friends, have we had a good time tonight? Man. It has been so much fun to just sit in a parking lot, even though it's a little hot outside, to eat a hot dog with you, to just uh, have fun together at the Big Orange Tailgate. It's been fun to, to come in and to listen to Joan and to Bill. Uh, it's been fun to kick off our Wednesday night events that we're uh, doing. Next uh, Wednesday, we will be in here at 6 o'clock. Uh, we have had several people in our church affected by suicide just in this last six months. And so we are doing, uh, Mark Reedy has helped us out to uh, get in touch with the Suicide Awareness Program, and that's what's going on next week. Uh, this is something that hits close to home. Uh, to Keith. So I hope that you will uh, uh, be involved in that and come uh, get some good information on that. Uh, the week after that is when we begin our small groups. Uh, we have children's ministry, youth ministry, and adult ministry going on. Uh, the adults are going to be studying the Apostles' Creed. Aren't y'all excited? <laughs> I know you're excited about that. So uh, we're going to kick off by studying the Apostles' Creed. Uh, let me tell you, and I, and I say this every Sunday, I, I don't say it every Sunday, I should. Uh, I am so honored to be your coach, your pastor. Uh, I told somebody earlier today that uh, you all have been the most welcoming church I have ever been a part of. Uh, and I needed a win. I needed a win in a church because I had uh, um, come across some losses, I guess you could say, in my former appointments. There had been some difficult seasons, but man, coming into Keith, y'all have just overwhelmingly welcomed me, and I am so glad for that. Thank y'all so much. Thank y'all so much. So uh, let us pray this evening, and a uh, couple of people that we can be in prayer for, y'all want to know how to pray specifically, you can be praying for uh, Karen Bailey who is uh, at UT Hospital. She is doing better tonight. Uh, she had had some uh, issues with some keto acidosis going on, but they've given her uh, some fluid and some medication that's helped with that. She should uh, move out of ICU tonight or in the morning, but uh, she is doing uh, much better. And I might get hit for this, but Bill Tyndall is having a heart procedure in the morning. Bill? Larry Rhodes, Bill Tyndall is not, Karen is having surgery uh, next week, but Larry Rhodes is having a heart surgery uh, procedure tomorrow. Uh, I'm new at this, right? So uh, y'all help me out. I'm still learning names. Larry, we're praying for you in the morning that things will go well with that. And uh, where are the Tyndalls at? We're praying for them that their surgery goes well on Monday. Just got the two confused. Uh, but let us, let's end in prayer tonight, if that's all right with you all. God, what a great night it has been to uh, be in uh, your house, just having fun together, just fellowshipping together, and uh, just uh, being able to be encouraged by the testimonies of faith, the testimonies of, of uh, life and faith, how they intersect. And God, I'm grateful for uh, this congregation who continues to uh, surprised me in so many unique ways. I'm grateful for those who have come together tonight to uh, sponsor this. I'm grateful for those who have, have come to be a part of this. So thank you, God, for uh, allowing us to be encouraged tonight. Thank you for allowing us to come together in your house and allow us to um, not forget that you are always with us, that your faithfulness always surrounds us, and that your love never fails us. For it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Give a hand for the Mayfield band that was here tonight. That was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. We're grateful for that.
Friends, this does not let you out of worship on Sunday. We'll see you at 9 or 11. If you won the football tickets, come see me. I'll tell you how to get them. Thank you all.